we are gathered here in the community center in Diamond Valley to hear from Barbara Johnston about indoor seed planting. Is that correct? Well, starting. Indoor seed starting. And so we appreciate all of you being here and those of you that are on Zoom. And we've asked Sandra Cox to give us an opening prayer. That's our tradition. I always start with a prayer. Sandra. And then we'll turn the time over to Barbara. Yes, I should come up here. Dear Father, we are so grateful for this beautiful Diamond Valley that we get to reside in and, and for the friendships that we've made and good community. We pray that thou will bless us as we get ready for our gardens, that we can have thy blessing and that our gardens can be successful. Please bless our presenter, Barbara, that the words will come easily to her and we can learn much. We pray for thy guidance and protection in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sandra. I'm Barbara Johnston. I think everybody knows me except for you. Tell me who you are. I'm Peggy Love. I live on the southwest corner of Sapphire Mountain Valley. Okay. I know that house. So a little bit about me, I have gardened my entire life, but Diamond Valley is a completely different gardening animal. So I've been here six years and I'm still learning, but seed starting is pretty much the same wherever you are. So what I want to know, what are you guys interested in learning about today? Remember from last year, when you plant your seeds, if you don't have a light, then they get all spindly. So you, you're interested in lights? Yes. I cannot write on the board for whatever reason. What other things are you interested in knowing about? What soil or what mix you need to So soil. planting mix? <laughs> Watering. My writing on the board may not be helpful at all. Temperature. Temperature. Are there good and bad seeds? Ooh. Seed selection, huh? We're just going to say seeds. Anything else? Uh, times. Timing. When we should start. Okay, and timing. Put them in the ground. Anything else? It's quite a list. It's quite a list. Okay. So we're going to play a little game to start with. And most of what I have here is on that list. And we're going to decide what do we have to have and what do we not have to have. So I have some seed starting mix. Do we have to have seed starting mix or can we use soil from outside? Can we make our own blend? What are your ideas? Yes, shout them out. Yes, it's better to have that, but you can do something else. Okay, we're gonna put this in the must have and we'll talk about it. Okay, okay. And I'm working with my limited space here. Um, a fan, must have, don't need it at all, might help. Must need it if you have it. Might help. Might help. Depends okay. on where your seeds are located. Depends on. Where you're keeping your seeds. Okay. I'm going to put it in the maybe pile. Is everybody comfortable with maybe? Must have maybes. Yes. Lighting. Absolutely and critical. Lighting. Yes. Critical. Okay. Because I had spindly seeds. <laughs> you need a spray bottle? Um, it can be. It, you need something to moisten the top until they start. And so, yeah. Should I put it in the must have or the maybe pile? Maybe. Optional. What's okay? We're going to put it in the optional pile. Um, the, oh. <laughs> I don't know if it's in the car. We're here without one bucket. 
Uh oh. Nick, will you look and see if there's another bucket in the car that has the, the heating mat? And <laughs> I think I saw something. Let me, is that okay. the mat right there? No. Nope. There's one more white bucket of supplies. Okay, well, let's go on to see what else I have. Um, seed starting trays. Do you need to have seed starting trays? I would say yes. In the yes, definite. You can use container. cups. Oh. So we're going to say containers. You have to have a container. Yes. yes. I mean, you could use a yogurt cup. There's a lot of stuff you could use. All right. Um, a timer. That timer and the, the mat are in the same bucket. The car. The car's locked. The car's locked. It's there's a code. There's a code. And I can't think of it. Fred, you talk. Fred's gonna talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> While she goes and finds everything. There's some really cool goodies here. Um, when we went to buy seed starting mix this year, there's really hard uh, Compressed. Oh, the the um, peat moss coconut. compressed, and it's and it's got other stuff in it. Both of them list the same ingredients, so we actually bought some of both. Oh. And figured we could. It's not in there, huh? We got here without that bucket. Okay. So just we'll talk. visualize. <laughs> okay. do, you, do you need a timer? Is that something you have to have? Oh, you no. do. Do you? I'm asking. I would say no. No. Put that in the luxury pile? Yeah. Okay. How about a heating mat? Yes, no, luxury pile? Luxury pile. We'll put that in the luxury it depends pile. Depends on where you're starting your seats. Does it? If it's outdoors and it's not house temperature, probably. Where are we starting our seas? Inside. This is the name of the class, yeah. is inside. inside. <laughs> so our whole focus is on inside. inside. So it's 70 degrees inside already. So then I would need say a, unless it's your garage. It. Okay, so we're going to pretend we have the mat here. Put it in the maybe pile or put it in the yes pile. Everybody's agreeing on maybes? Yes. Yeah. What about this handy dandy? seed starting kit it's got those little pellets that expand with water and a humidity dome would this be a good thing for first timers yes oh, yeah <laughs> first -timers. Waste. Instruction. waste of time waste. okay <laughs> this is in the don't bother category oh, really? oh okay is it because of the humidity dome you do not need a humidity dome. In yeah. fact, I advise against them. Because yeah, it keeps it too wet. And then what happens is disease sets in. Also, those little pellets that expand, and also in the missing bucket is those um, little um, biodegradable cups. They never break down. Never. Oh. And, so, and they lose water so fast that you just fight them the entire time. Yeah. So I'm going to say a big fat no. You are much better with your yogurt cup or your solo cup to start your seeds than you would ever be with this. And also in the missing bucket is some saran wrap, <laughs> which instead of a humidity dome, when your seeds are germinating, just lay a piece of saran wrap loosely over. And that does a much better job because you can still get airflow from the sides and yet it helps the moisture stay in. Let's see if there's anything else that, oh, we talked about this light. Do you have to have a grow light to start seeds? One that's specifically no. a grow light. No. You do not. And we're gonna talk more about lighting. In fact, since that was at the top of our list, maybe we should do that first because lighting seems to be the area that gives people the most concern is so confusing and if you go online yes. <laughs> there is conflicting information galore so let's start there i am going to show you what i have used this was my i'm not sure if i'm gonna enjoy seed starting or be successful at it it's a shop light housing with two fluorescent bulbs in it i watched a youtube video which i later learned well that wasn't exactly correct, but this works still. So what it's got in it is um, a warm light and a cool light. 
That is called Kelvin. Kelvin gives you the temperature of your light. The higher the number, the brighter the light, the more like sunlight it is. So our goal with Kelvin is between 5,000 and 6,500. If you go, you know what? This, is, this has two bulbs in it, and this is one of the bulbs that I purchased. It says that the Kelvin on this one, I can tell it's the yellow bulb, is 3,500. And the Kelvin on the white bulb is 6,500. Mm -hmm. Because the mistaken video I watched said, well, you need a full spectrum. You need cool light, you need warm light. We are starting seeds. We are not growing plants that are gonna stay in our house all the time. If that were the case, if you had something fruiting or flowering that you were growing in the house full time, you need a grow light that has all of those spectrums in it because different qualities of light um, are better for fruiting, different qualities are better for flowering, different for putting out leaves. We are starting seeds. We are growing our plants outside. We don't need that full spectrum. There any confusion about if we're just using our lights for starting seed, do not spend a lot of money on grow lights. Now, if your intent is to grow, let's say you want to grow lettuce in your house in the winter, then you would need a grow light that has the full spectrum in it. Or if you wanted to have other fruiting and flowering vegetables in your house full time. We are just starting seeds. Have I said it enough? We are just starting seeds. So don't waste a bunch of money. All you need to look for are two things. You want your Kelvin between 5,000 and 6,500. And the other thing is lumens. Lumens, how bright the light is. We're trying to mimic the sun, so we want bright. The minimum in lumens is 2,000 to 3,000. So I stopped at Home Depot yesterday just to see what they had. And they did have some grow lights. I looked at them, even though that's not what I was interested in. The grow light packages had almost no information on them. So didn't know the Kelvin, didn't know the lumens, didn't know anything um, that were really helpful. But they did, they had commercial and industrial lights. We're addressing the honking horn button. Not I don't think it's fine. It should go off eventually. So they have some industrial grade shop lights. I did find one where the Kelvin was as high as 5,000. That's the highest I could find at Home Depot. But the lumens were 18,000. So if we're just looking for something that's um, above 2,000, and now you've got a lumens of 18,000, is that better or worse for your plant? Shouldn't be harmful. Trick questions. It should be okay. It should be okay. All right, so let's talk about why. Here are my old fluorescent lights. Here's my seed tray. These fluorescent lights have very little lumens. To grow, I need this light right down here. Let's pretend this is that commercial shop light that has 18,000 lumens. Where do you think I put my light? <laughs> Probably like this. So when you're thinking, shop light that's a hundred dollars that is so expensive i want you to consider the square footage that you gain how much real estate you gain with that brighter light because now you can put it farther away your shine radius is bigger so you only need one light to probably do a four by six area so when you look at it at total cost to set up a nice grow area hundred dollars they started about 75 to 110 those commercial ones as opposed to buying a single grow light that was two feet long and i think it was 45 dollars and lit up an area that was two by three so you're looking at 24 feet sorry my little financial brain has to calculate this all out 24 feet square feet of growing space for $100 versus six square feet for 45. It makes sense to me, go with the more expensive light. And again, you're just starting the seeds inside. We don't care if it's a full spectrum light. 
We only care that it's at least 2,000 in lumens and at least 5,000 to 6,500 in Kelvin. So, we so want what is that spotlight? You could put any bulb in there that meets those requirements. Okay. Now, the drawback is, depending upon those lumens, how much you can fit under there. So if your lumens are lesser and you're closer, you have a pretty limited amount of space that you can start seeds in. You can get 30,000, I don't know if it's a single bulb you can, but you can get lights that are 30,000 lumens. I mean, that can be the single light bulb in your ceiling and you can start lights from there. So, I mean, start seeds from there. So this could get farther and farther away and light up a progressively larger and larger area that you could start seeds in. So my purpose for bringing this and bringing this, are they ideal? No, it works. And this was so economical. I bought actually two of these with the bulbs for less than $35. Hmm. Now, because they're fluorescent, again, let's talk about real estate. It has to be close. So on my foot wide shelf, I have to hang these right next to each other. And then I can, they cover a tray like this, the two hanging over it. And I can actually fit two trays, but they don't cover any more than that because of their fluorescent and low lumens, comparatively speaking to 18,000 or 30,000. 30,000, we're talking commercial growers. Probably your home grower is not gonna have lights like that. Well, it depends on what they're growing. So, um, any questions about lighting? I mean, that is really the simple end of it. You're just looking for that many lumens, that many Kelvins. It doesn't matter if it's a grow light. How long do you leave it on? Do you keep it on all the time? Thank you. Nope. Just like people, your plants need to rest. So starting out 18 hours a day, let's say you don't have that luxury timer. Turn the lights on when you get up, turn them off when you go to bed. And then at about three weeks, you start moving backwards. Let me just set this down. Okay, what about just setting them in the sunlight? We're going to get to that hardening off point in just a second. So let's talk about how long on the lights and why then you reduce the lights. So when you're first starting seeds, it takes a ton of energy for them to grow and they need all that light. As they start to grow and put out leaves, the leaves collect light. So they don't need as much. More and more leaves, more sunlight collectors, you can reduce the time. So that's how I judge how long to leave the lights on. Weather permitting, as soon as they germinate, I start putting them outside. During the day. During the day. So start for an hour a day, work up a little bit every day. So they're getting all that great outdoor light. Now, think of these as a baby. You're not gonna take your baby and skim out in the sun in the middle of the day for an hour. What you might do is find a, um, sheltered place, out of the wind, um, maybe early morning when the sun's not so intense. Because for all intents and purposes, these are my babies. I am, want them to succeed and grow. So I don't want to sit them out midday in the hot sun and fry them. We're going to ease into that. So these I actually started two weeks ago. It's some lettuce, and I've been putting them outside every day this week because they germinated within three days. So what you'll notice by being outside is you get better color on your leaves and also they get less stocky, light. When we talked about being spindly, if your plants are not getting enough light, that's when they become spindly because they're reaching for light. Now, lettuce, do you have to seed start in the house lettuce or can't you just throw them you out can just them? throw them out there i was um, going to say the cold weather plants you can at this point can't you? yes there are a lot of things you can put outside right now um, that are cold weather my reason for starting some things like lettuce in the house well if i want to get just a little jump on um, the weather but also when i'm dealing with really tiny seeds and then i plant them outside and i'm trying to water those Sometimes they get washed away. And that's the same thing can happen when you're starting your seeds. So a spray bottle is really helpful to keep it moist, but not sopping wet. Um, if you have a watering can that's got the little nozzle, 
We're trying to keep them moist, not sopping and not wash your seeds away. So that process of taking them out over time and putting them outside, getting them used to daylight is called hardening off. And that's true with any plant that's been started inside or even in a greenhouse. It has to be slowly taken outside. Answer all questions on lighting, hardening off. Um, south facing windows. Generally not enough light. And didn't you find that at your house? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we still have lights over the grow area, even though they're right there in a south facing window. Mm -hmm. It's just not enough. Mm -hmm. um, and even now, are we about 12 hours of sunlight outside right now? <clears throat> if you're starting seeds that prefer 18 to get going, 12 just isn't enough. So that's where your lights can really help you. Uh, yes, a question. Before they sprout, before they pop up, do they need the lights on? Mm -mm. No, okay. They don't. So, oh, okay. So after they come out of the ground, then you put the lights on. You can do it either way, but you don't have to have light on them until they germinate and you see them. And they will germinate in total darkness. <coughs> okay. And then, go ahead. Now I assume if you're using <coughs> the yogurt or plastic things or anything, you have to punch holes in the bottom. You do. So we're going to come back to containers, but let's talk about, we're talking about germination, about soil temperature. So these were started in my basement that is, in the winter it's about 60 degrees because we just turn off the heat down there with no heat map, no additional heat. Um, they're a cool weather crop, meaning they prefer weather to be cool. You can sow them outside when it's when you still have a hard frost. Um, most of them will survive if it's a really bad frost. No. For those of you who remember 2017, when we had a very hard frost after Mother's Day, which is usually the average last frost date here, these probably would not have made it through that. Um, but no heat map, and they grew fine. If you're doing warm weather plants, a heat mat is helpful but not required because warm weather plants like that warmer soil. Now, if you are using a heat mat, how long do you leave it on? Same as the light? Well, my, so let's say my plants have germinated and look like this. So I have, I have my heat mat on or do I turn it off? Not needed anymore if your seed is already germinated. Once your seed has germinated, turn that heat mat off. The reason being, let's think about a seed outside. The leaves are trying to reach for the light. What are the roots trying to get? Down. Down to cooler, cooler and water. So you've got your plant on a heat mat now. It's germinated. The roots would like to go down, but what are they finding when they go down? It's hot. So they're going to go away from the bottom and you're not going to get root development that you need. You really want good root development. So that's why a heat mat to me is in the luxury category. You really don't need it. And people tend to overuse it and leave those heat mats on all the time. But it affects um, your root development. So don't need a heat mat. Good. Containers. I have a variety of containers, a yogurt container, um, this is a bigger six pack cell. Um, in the bucket that didn't make it here, there were some solo cups. I have some four inch blocks like this. All will work. What you do want to keep in mind is the speed with which your plant grows and if it's shallow rooted or deep rooted. So, this is my smallest little six pack. Let's say I had what grows big fast, watermelon seeds. I probably would not start them in here. I probably would direct sow them. For, but for the sake of example, I wouldn't start them in here. They grow so fast, I would have to move them up to a larger size pot really quickly. Lettuce, very shallow root system. I'm happy to start them in this little six pack and it's just fine. A tomato, what do you think on a tomato? This size, this size? As big as you can get. <laughs> my tomato in here well at least the second transplant <laughs> but four inch for sure on a tomato okay why is that i'm going to make you tell us why 
Well, my experience is if you don't start it in something that it actually can root in, uh, the transplant is really hard on it. I don't start them in the smaller ones. Yeah, this would probably be the smallest I would start a tomato yeah. in. But this, if you're thinking, man, I am gonna start my seeds super early, then by the time it's past that last frost day, my tomato's gonna be big, I'll transplant it and I'll have tomatoes right away. Couple of problems with that theory. First of all, your plant is gonna go through so much transplant shock, going from a big container and having reached much bigger growth, mm -hmm. that trying to transplant it at that stage of its life is really hard on it. Secondly, too big of a container, it retains way too much moisture when you're trying to start seeds. And so it's unlikely that you would get a healthy plant. Even, I mean, that the seed might not even germinate, it might rot because of all the moisture that this much soil um, holds on to. Okay, question. Uh -huh. So in that forage pot, do I just take one tomato seed? Let's do it. <laughs> Do I put two tomatoes seeds Let's in there? Let's do it. We're going to plant. But hold on. I'm going to sidetrack into one thing first. Let's talk about what we're going to plant in. So we decided that our seed starting mix was a must have. And I've got several samples here. What you want in seed starting mix is fluff. You want it to be so fluffy that your little seed doesn't have to battle anything to grow. Clay soil, think of your little seed trying to get through that clay soil. Um, so this is the commercial potting mix. It's actually this Jiffy brand. I am not married to any seed starting brand. Um, so this eight quart bag costs about nine or $10 and it'll fill 14 this size. So is that potting mix? This is seed starting mix. It actually says seed starting on it. Say that again. What is the difference in potting okay. mix? Okay, so let's look because I happen to have here. Yes, it is. Where is my potting soil? That's the seed starting mix. This is the potting soil. You're going to have to come and look closely. This has got big chunks of stuff in it. Can you see that? I'm just oh. going to throw it on the table. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's potting soil. Then I have sifted potting soil. This is my sifter. I use it compost, for compost, and for if I needed to use regular potting mix, I could sift out some of that big stuff. And so this is now falling in between the fluffy seed starting mix and the big chunky potting soil. So you could use that sifted and it would be fine. And a homemade one that you can make is with some vermiculite and some peat moss, and that'll work. But just never, ever, 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 ever use soil from outside. It has too many opportunities for disease in it. It's not fluffy. You know, do you guys have, I don't have fluffy soil at my house. Do you have fluffy soil at your house? People are laughing. <laughs> so, um, so make sure that you are starting with a good medium, either the specifically seed starting mix. Next choice would be some sifted potting soil. But come after, after we're done talking, come and see the differences. And then it's really apparent. So... It's important that the medium be sterile. Disease carries over in dirt from year to year. And so even though this says sterile on it, I still dump some potting mix into, or sea starting mix into my bowl and I pour boiling water on it. Because it I have to get it wet anyway why not spend an extra 30 seconds and put some boiling water on it to kill anything that might be in there? Because it happens. Sometimes at the manufacturer, soil gets contaminated for whatever reason. If it's only taking me 30 seconds and it means that I have some truly sterile seed starting medium, I'm gonna do that. 
So that's what I've done. I've already gotten this wet with the boiling water. And you want it about like a sponge. I don't know if you can see, it's, it holds together a little bit, but it's not dripping wet. If I squeeze it, I can get a little bit of water out of there. And the reason you want to do that, again, this stuff is awfully dry. Have you ever tried to get peat moss wet? Peat moss wet? It's really dry. So you want to get it dry before you put it in your container instead of trying to get it all moist when your seed's in there and you're having to add so much water and your seed's floating away. So I've got it wet. I have also sterilized my containers. I use these containers over and over. So what I do is I rinse all the dirt out and then I make a solution of one, per, one part leach to 10 parts water. And I throw these in that five gallon bucket with that solution and let them sit for 15 or 20 minutes. And when I'm really lazy, I run them through the dishwasher. Dishwasher's my best friend. But not the heat cycle. <laughs> you know what, they go through the whole thing. I just really? make sure they're in the top. So this one actually went through the dishwasher. But I know it is clean. I know my soil is clean. So I'm going to fill it up, and this is exactly how I do it at home, and press down. You want to press down so you feel some resistance, because if your seed is just floating in there with no resistance and the roots have air exposure, it's going to kill the plant. Just like if, when you bury something outside or plant something outside. You don't want air when you plant, um, air around the roots when you plant, because that will kill your plant. So I've kind of packed it down a little bit, not hard like cement. You can still see it's got some spring, but there's not air in there. My hands are wicky. You want to open that? So we're going to plant tomatoes because about now is when we're starting to plant tomatoes and we're going to talk about when to plant. I put, to answer your question, two seeds in, in two opposite corners. And why I do two, Thank you. And we might even use three because that's what's here. Is if one doesn't make it, you've still got a tomato. If both survive, you can make the decision, oh, I'll keep the healthier one and you dispose of the other one, you do not pull it out. You just cut it off at ground level because by pulling it out, you disturb the roots and you could kill your good one. Or you can divide the, um, the pot and keep both tomatoes. So it's whatever you wanna do. I read the instructions. It's all on your packet. It should be, if you've got seeds, it says that it takes seven to 14 days to sprout. Ideal temperature, and this is ambient temperature, not soil, 75 to 95 degrees, seed depth, 1 8 inch. Spacing, we're gonna talk about that. And frost hardy, no. And it also says it needs 8 to 12 hours of sun. So now I'm just going to come back with a little soil, pat that down, we're good to go. Going to put it under my lights. I do have a timer after I said they're not completely necessary, but again, because I'm lazy. Same reason I use the dishwasher. I'm lazy. And that's all it takes. If I were going to use a six pack like this, I'd do the same thing, just put the dirt in them all, pat it down, put my seeds in, put a little more on. And some seeds it even says surface sow, like onions. You just scatter them over the top and you don't put anything else on the top. Now, have I answered container questions? Let's talk, let's see what we've talked about and what we still okay, need. Okay, question. Yes. Green onions, would you just stick them out in your yard or would you? The seeds for them? Green onions. Yeah, green onion seeds, like bunching onion seeds. Yeah. I would do both. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about onions just for a second. So onions, their roots are so durable. When I sow onions, and I don't have any of it here, I will scatter probably half a package of seeds over this much surface. And then they're gonna grow up like grass. When it's time to transplant, you can pull those apart and not worry about um, destroying the roots because their roots are just tenacious. 
and it's not going to hurt them. I will confess, green onions, bunching onions, I've had very little success with those. I haven't tried them here, but in our last home, I never had success. And I think if I were going to try it today, I would do the same thing. I would try them just like I do bulbing onions. I can't get mine to get big. Mine just... Well, I'm talking Your about onions? little ones that you want to add to you. Nitrogen. nitrogen. Onions take a lot of nitrogen. They are heavy feeders. They are. Um, and so one of the things you want to do with onions, just kind of sidetracking from seed starting, is when the greens grow and the onions are bulbing, I cut the greens off to about six inches. Then the energy is in the bulb and not the, the greens. And I make an onion green, onion top pesto out of it. So it's not going to waste. And that onion top pesto is really good. Were you saying it was really good? I hope you were saying it was really good, Nick. <laughs> okay. So um, it's, there are a lot of parts of plants that we don't eat. Like who would think to eat the onion tops? If they're not green onions, who would think to do that? But they make a really good pesto. I know I missed somebody's question. Somebody asked something else and I got sidetracked. Okay, so that is how I plant. We were gonna go through the list. We talked about lights. We talked about planting mix. We talked a little bit about watering. So when I first have my tomatoes planted, I'm just gonna keep them misted on top to keep them wet. When they start to germinate, I will water from the bottom sometimes. So I have my containers here. I put some water in the bottom, let them sit for 15 minutes, take the container out, dump the water. Um, because now I'm not so concerned about the seed washing away. It's germinated, it's bigger. And then some seed starting mixes say they have fertilizer in them. I use a diluted fish emulsion. Um, after my seeds, I'm probably starting at about two weeks, like these are ready. Um, that I would use a diluted fish emulsion of probably quarter strength and I water from the bottom. And that seems to be all it takes. In another week or two, I will transplant these into the garden. Other watering questions? Yes. Yes. Diamond Valley, we've got beautiful water. There's no chlorine in it. There's no chemicals in it. For people who don't live in a place where there's clean water, What's the consideration on chlorine and, and other problems like that? I am not an expert there, mm. but I know that I came from highly treated water and I did not have trouble with, I didn't do very much seed starting then, but I didn't have any trouble in my garden. We had quite a fantastic garden, not because of the gardener being skilled, but because we had built bones in this garden that made it everything grow really well. The location was perfect. We had amended the soil. It was on um, irrigation on timers. So it was a set it and forget it as much as a garden can be because you still need to go out and pay attention. Stuff can happen overnight in your garden. You think everything is going well and you go out the next day like, what happened here? But um, that, that was truly, not the gardener skill, it was everything that we set up. And that was with help from a friend of mine who was the best master gardener that I had ever seen. So can I answer your questions about what's, how those things in water affect the garden? I did not see it in that particular garden. So not a good answer probably. Um, Moving on, unless anybody else has insight into that. Have you had experiences, Fred, where what's in the water is affected? If it's too hard, uh, salty, whatever, it does affect it. Plants are pretty forgiving. They are quite forgiving. Okay, now I have, there's my little pen. So we've talked about lights, we've talked about planting mix. Any more watering questions? So you wanna keep moist, letting them dry a little bit between waterings, but you're not sopping wet. Your seeds can rot too much water. Okay. Temperature, let's talk a little bit more about temperature. We talked, we don't need the heat mat. All my cool weather stuff, I started downstairs without the heat mat in a cool room, it's 60 degrees there. And they're thriving, they're completely happy with that. Now, my fluorescent lights do give off some heat. 
LED lights won't give off any heat, but my fluorescent lights do. So they have that little bit of supplementary heat. Um, I, as long as it's above freezing, and I'm gonna say above 45 for starting cold weather seeds, in your room, they'll start. If they have light, and even if your room's 45, they'll still grow. Because outside, that's what they'd be experiencing. And I know Fred had planted seed, well, he had some volunteer peas and planted some peas, and they started sprouting- Two months you? ago. And so two months ago, it was fairly cold here mm -hmm. and freezing at night, and the seeds still started. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we feel we really have to baby things after I talked about, oh, <laughs> I babied my lettuce, I'm not gonna put it out in the sun. Sun heat can kill, <laughs> but usually cool for cool weather plants, I don't find it to be the same. And his volunteer peas, that really tells you when it's time to plant, when things that have volunteered start coming up, it's like, oh, it's time to do that because they have their own timer, they know when it's appropriate and they're starting to grow. Same thing with onions. One other method that I had tried that was recommended to me and it worked really well, took a salad container, the big plastic ones, put some holes in the bottom, filled it with uh, seed starting medium, covered it with the onion seeds. Again, you can sew those close, put the lid on and just put it in a kind of sheltered area on my back patio. And the direction was they'll start growing when it's time for them to start growing. And that's exactly what happened. So that was so easy because it took no effort on my part. I just did that and left it there. And once they got about that high, then I transplanted them into the garden. But it took no other effort, no maintenance, no heat light, no watering, it did it all. Is it too late to do that with onion seeds now? You know, we have such uncertain, <laughs> yeah. But technically, it shouldn't be too late, but Diamond Valley, the weather here is so unpredictable. That it's an easy way to do it. Okay, was that, that was really glossing over temperature fast. Are there any other temperature questions? Are certain seeds very temperature mm, picky? I'm going to say warm weather crops are a lot more temperature picky because if it's cold, they will not grow. Cold weather seeds will start even if it's warm. They're just not going to produce a plant that's enjoyable to eat because that heat can make the um, plant bolt greens yeah. and um, Coal crops, it makes the plant taste bitter, so it's not good to eat. It's still going to grow and thrive. It's just not going to be something you want to eat. Whereas warm weather crops, just in cold, will not grow. They'll just sit there. Um, so, are we done with temperature? Yes. Okay. How about seeds? Does it matter? Where you get your seeds? Well, I know there's heirloom seeds and then there's hybrid. What's the difference? And then there's bulk and there's you can gather taxes. seeds on heirloom seed. You can save the seeds. Because what, what's happened to a hybrid? It's a mixture and it will separate. So yes. So if you take a hybrid seed and you try and start it it's gonna to revert to one of the um, characteristics of the parent plant. So it's just like your children. You have, let's say you have seven children. Do all of them look identical? Does one favor the father, one favors the mother? Some look identical, some look different. That's exactly what happens with um, hybrid seeds when you plant them. They'll sometimes, maybe, you could plant five hybrid seeds and none of them will be the same. They'll all take some characteristics of the parents. How was that for an explanation? <laughs> they still grow. They grow and they'll produce things that probably taste great. And most of us don't collect the seeds after. So, and I wanted to ask if anybody was interested in seed saving, if that's a class that Fred and Clark should consider. I did it. And for, so for Christmas, I gave zucchini seeds and the next year I had people asking me, 
Did you do that again? Your seeds worked great. Mm -hmm. And let's, let's segue over here a little bit. This is an emergency preparedness class. So how does seed starting and gardening fit into that? Uh, we better we know how to save seeds. seeds. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my consideration is, could you grow food like your life depended on it if you needed to? I hope so. <laughs> and so let's say, okay, the, the seed store is not available to me anymore. What is my option? Can I save my own seed? Or two years ago in 2020, and what really caused me to become the seed starting maven that I'm trying to be is that I couldn't get the starts that I wanted. And when I went to Ballard's, they were on their third time through. They had started three sets of seeds because their inventory was wiped out. And so if you couldn't get seeds, if you couldn't get starts, what would you do? Could you grow food as if your life depended on it? And that's really how it ties into emergency preparedness. Now, if you look over here, you will see that I have become a seed hoarder. All of us are busy. That is why my seeds are organized like this, not because I am fanatical about order, but I don't wanna waste time hunting for seeds. I wanna know what I've got and where it is. So these are just picture boxes that you can put photos in. They're the perfect side to put seed packages in. And then I can see in an instant, okay, slicing tomatoes, what have I got? And then I don't order the same thing, which tends to be my habit if I can't find what I've got. And you will see that I have two, Paul Robeson tomatoes. We might have to give those as a bonus price tonight because um, these are one of my friend's very favorites. Now she lives in the East. I had to try them and I ordered two. So we'll give those away for fun tonight. Um, so seeds, does it matter that I got my seeds from Baker Creek, one of the ultimate best um, heritage, um, heirloom, all those kinds of things. Does it matter that I have that versus the burpee seeds that I got at Ace Hardware last year, end of season, for 25 cents. Does it matter? It might not germinate. In a pinch, you're glad you have any. You know what? I've never had any less germination with this than with this. Mm. A lot depends on how's it been stored. And if they've been stored the same, the germination rate for me, in my experience, and I'm sure there are exceptions, there are always exceptions, has been no different. But I'm like, oh, 25 cents. Sure, I'll try that variety. I mean, what have you got to lose for 25 cents? And if you're concerned about, am I really gonna enjoy seed starting? Do I wanna spend $100, which you don't have to spend $100 to get started and then find out I don't like it? Use the 25 cent package of seeds instead. Even the dollar store, now the dollar 25 store has seeds, so. You don't have to pay a lot for seeds. And um, IFA has 20% off seeds and 25% off certain seed starting supplies. And really, so let's talk about it. Sure. You're, you're buying your, your soil, your seed starting soil. You're reusing containers to start your seeds in. How long will those seeds last? We're gonna talk about that. I'm gonna have a link on the website too. Um, lettuces are probably some of your longest lasting seeds, all your greens, five or six years. Shortest is corn. Um, tomatoes, I'm going to put in the three or four range. Melons and winter squashes in the four or five years range. I started last year a French melon. I'm pretty sure that the seeds were seven years old. So if last they were start, they were packaged for the year 2014 and I had never grown one. And I planted three, every single one of them growed. Growed? Grew. <laughs> <laughs> really. So I say do a uh, test of the germination. Get a paper towel, wet, wring it dry so it's damp, um, lay 10 seeds out on it, fold it up with the seeds inside, put it in a baggie, seal it up, 
Know the germination date. So the tomatoes we just looked at were, were they seven to 14 days? Mm -hmm. So in seven to 14 days, start checking them. And if they're germinating, little roots are coming out, then you can test and say, okay, I planted 10, five germinated. So I have a 50% success rate. If I plant this seed, I can expect 50% to grow. So that seed that was in the paper towel, can you stick that in the dirt or will it not survive? You could. Um, it's just another experiment. It okay. depends on the seed. Sometimes there are just suicides in the garden. You do it all right. You give that seed everything it wants or that plant everything it wants. And for some reason it doesn't survive. And this is really obvious when you plant two of the same thing right next to each other, like a shrub, two shrubs right next to each other. And the next year one dies and one thrives. They are next to each other. They've had all the same care. So sometimes there are just suicides in the garden and that's how it is. It's not because you did something wrong. It's just because that plant has decided it's not gonna survive. So I would say throw them in the dirt and give it a try. Yeah. You don't have anything to lose from that. What about putting seeds in the freezer? I have not tried that. There are some seeds that require being chilled. There's a word for that. Well, I, I've been over to Colorado Springs. Is the USDA's storage seed storage for the nation. Mm -hmm. And it's all frozen. Is it? Some seeds have to be stratification. Frozen. Stratification. Stratification. Yeah. Stratification. That's not right. Stratification. Yeah. Some seeds have to be frozen to start. And uh, that's, I don't remember. It'll usually say on the packet. Yes. And that's because in nature, they require that freeze, that cold weather is assigned to them, don't grow yet. And then when it's warm, okay, grow now. But so they need that cold weather as part of their cycle and we are mimicking that with the refrigerator because it's not out there growing naturally and that's really what we're trying to do in seed starting we're trying to give the seeds the very best of what's outside in our home so we're giving it light we're giving it water we didn't talk about the fan outside there's a well there's almost always a breeze here but a wind um, we're trying to mimic that, what it would be like outside. And why you want that is because if your plants aren't used to that kind of resistance, then they become leggy they, and they fall over with the littlest bit of breeze or any weather. Let's, if you do not have a fan, again, we put it in the maybes, all you do is a couple of times a day, take your hand and run it back and forth over the plants. And it does the same thing. So it makes them grow stronger. Yeah. More sturdy. Stronger and more sturdy. So just keep in mind, we are trying to give them the best of what it would be like to start outside that we can control in our house. And so wind, sun, water, soil. That's and what we're mimicking. About soaking seeds. Now you're talking about the paper towel. I'm talking about corn or something that's peas. Somebody said once you should soak those overnight and then plant. Peas do better if you put a little nick in the pea, and that's got a certain name too. Oh, you guys are putting me on the spot. That's scarification. It, that's the scarification versus stratification. Where beans do better if you soak them overnight. Beans? Because um, mm -hmm. it just, it gives, they have that hard outer shell, for lack of a better word, to come through. So I've had more success, I soak beans, overnight i do a little nick in the pea but you don't have to do all that stuff this is just what can you do if you want to really do all you can for success <coughs> but think there are those seeds that you know volunteers they've had no no pampering whatsoever and they grow and they usually grow the best <coughs> Um, a few years ago, our chickens kept getting into our garden. So a couple of years ago, I was like, I'm not going to do a garden. We're putting up this huge wildlife fence. The chickens will be in there. I'll do a garden next year. But I still had compost. And right next to the compost pile, a tomato grew. And I know it was a hybrid seed. 
that tomato got no pampering. It not, no water, it got nothing. It was so loaded with tomatoes and completely ignored. The only thing I did do is like, oh, there's a tomato worm, we'll pull that off. <laughs> and it produced so long with so many tomatoes. Um, so sometimes we pamper our plants to death. And that's, there has to be some resistance, hence the fan or running your hand across the plants, um, letting your soil dry a little bit, not keeping it wet all the time. I'm trying to think what else do we do to mimic a little bit of stress so that your plants are ready when you put them outside. Got any ideas, Fred? Um, speaking of spindly plants, I make sure I put them down the opposite way when I do lift them up and put them back down again, because your grow light even only yes. gives light one direction. So yes, so that that kind of mimics the sun going overhead and yeah, and that's exactly it. So I'll rotate these within the container. Within the, I have all of my um, plants in flats like this. Everything is a I'm trying to think. Everything is designed to fit in this one by two space. So either you can have 18 of that size, you can have two wide six and of yeah, it's, two, it's one by two, like six of those. You can have eight of these, but everything is designed to fit in this space. And then there's a bigger pot that fits two by four. Um, which I don't know why I started talking about that, but it was, I think about just rotating. So whatever is in here, I rotate. One more thing about the expense of starting. So when I really decided I was going to be serious about seed starting, I still had a budget in mind. So these have lasted about five years and they're starting to tear. Um, I would say if you, if you know you're going to be starting seeds, go for a little better quality, something a little more durable. Um, the same with these. They're pretty flimsy. What I do like about them is you can squeeze and push on the back to get a, a seed out. Something hard, no, let's say this is a little harder. It might be a little more difficult to get your plant out and you don't necessarily want to be pulling on the stem. But you're eating lunch yogurt, just cut the side and tear it open. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that'll work. <laughs> so, um, now just stuff to keep in mind. Last year, I started every seed myself except for two things. And the two I didn't start myself were two tomato varieties I wanted to try and couldn't find seeds for at the time. And everything, every other thing in my garden, I started the seed for. And I realized it's not that hard. Even when I'm using my cheap fluorescent homemade light and my solo cups, because I started almost everything in this size and then potted up to a solo cup. One trick, if you're um, doing solo cups, stack them up and then drill through the bottom all at once so you're getting your hole in the bottom. There's no reason to do them one at a time. Just stack them up, run the drill through. So. Just one hole. <laughs> yeah, just needs to be able to drain. Okay. And I think my holes were three eighths of an inch diameter. Labeling. Mm -hmm. I am not as young as I used to be. And I may think, oh, I only started two varieties. I'll remember what's what. Ha! Ah! <laughs> Doesn't happen. <laughs> so you can buy these little fancy labels. Or you can go to your doctor's office and say, can I have some of those? <laughs> and they I have actually, them at the dollar store. They do. Yeah. <laughs> now, I the dollar twenty-five store, let's, yeah. let's talk about that. I, let's be, like and I actually prefer these because these fade in the sun. So, and they get brittle and break. So this is much better. Um, and it rots and, and just falls apart in the yeah, soil eventually. Yeah. So easy. Um, one more thing that I like to use, these are the Japanese chopsticks. And I have Chinese, but they're put away. So I have some disposable Chinese. The difference is the tip. These are very pointy, these are blunt. I love to use these 
let's say I had two tomatoes in one cell and I wanted to separate them because I want them both. I'm not going to cut one off and keep one. This moves the soil around so easily without disturbing the roots. So I really like the Japanese chopsticks for that reason. And then it's, it's very simple for me to, to take one out, take them both out and put them in bigger pots. I'm trying to think if there are any other tricks that I have that I think are easy. We did talk about seeds. Did we answer all your questions on seeds? Enough? Nobody has more questions? Okay, timing. So when I read my tomato plant package, it said, doo -doo -doo, it said nothing about when to start. It just said it's not frost hardy. Most so, of them say yeah. start six weeks before yeah. freeze or uh, something like that. <laughs> they do. Tomatoes, I guess they assume that you know that you're not going to plant those out before it freezes. So you're going to make a little container you're opening. Where did you find that? Oh, they're all over the place, but this was on Amazon. Except and it's just for photo storage, you said? Yep, it is for photo storage. I was trying to find something. You know, probably a cool weather crop is going to have it better, where it does say when to start it. I was going to say one other thing about Baker Creek, where probably 80% of my seeds come from. They send you free seeds and they're shipping, there's no shipping costs. So it makes it really a deal. Let's see, planting instructions. Oh, this is interesting. This is cabbage, best planted in midsummer for a fall harvest. So it'll tell you when to grow it. These are Brussels sprouts, that's why. Brussels now, sprouts. Where is the, what is the website we go to to know our location? So we are in 8A. 8A. Mm -hmm. Go to the Utah State Extension and Utah State Extension. Um, so here it's saying plant this eight weeks before the last frost, first frost. And you can cool weather crops not only spring but also in the fall. Warm weather crops, summer only. That's all you're going to get from them is summer only. So cool weather things you can get to harvest from. And a lot of them actually do better in the fall, such as the Brussels sprouts. It's saying plant those in the summer for a fall harvest. I did corn one year and we, we had a really late corn planting and they froze, they got frosted but they continued to finish out and they were delicious. Mm -hmm. Sometimes things taste a lot better after they've had a frost. Spinach, mm -hmm. all the Carrots. way through. Carrots, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this, you mean because they go sweet? Yes, they mm -hmm. get sweeter, exactly. And we have a family in um, Diamond Valley that grows grapes and they said, oh, the grapes are much better after they've had a frost. So, but the birds usually get them by then. Yeah. So yeah. that's, you know, they we're trying to time it. <laughs> Could they harvest the grapes before the birds get them and still get them as far along into the fall as they can. I love my carrots and my beets. I just picked up the last of my beets today. Mm -hmm. So they just overwintered in ground. Mm -hmm. Did you cover them? I just threw a tarp over the top and that kept them from freezing. Yeah, we don't get so cold here that our ground freezes, yeah. which is great for um, root crops over the winter. And you can put straw too. Yeah, and kale. I put leaves. My neighbor gave me a bunch of leaves. Mm -hmm. um, kale, I've had kale last the whole winter and be eating it all winter. So. Interesting. There's quite a few that last the whole winter. We had parsley and mm -hmm. spinach and even our red leaf lettuces made it clear through the winter and so did the um, several of the other green mustards and stuff like that. I'm going, wow. <laughs> yeah, those cool weather crops can be pretty tenacious. So that's a great thing to have so that you have fresh food all winter. Remember, we're trying to be prepared for an emergency. And just in the meantime, we're having a great time gardening and enjoying what we're harvesting. I have my potatoes in too. Okay, so. Time me. Look at your seed package. We know that our average 
last frost date, let's say this right, last frost date is Mother's Day. Kind of Mother's Day is the easy to remember. It's an average. That means it can freeze in the end of May because that happened 2017. I keep bringing that up mm -hmm. <laughs> because so many Diamond Valley gardeners lost what they had planted. It was just mm -hmm. an, an anomaly. <laughs> and sometimes it gets hot so fast. <laughs> yes. And then everything wants to bolt uh -huh. and then you get a freeze. It's being a gardener mm -hmm. in Diamond Valley mm -hmm. and a lot of other places too. So I will, I'm going to have some links and one of the links is going to be to timing and it's, I really like this particular um, website. I think it's um, Penn State and they have whatever the um, vegetable is, how long it takes to grow, how long it takes to germinate. If you're starting indoors, start your seed this many weeks before the last frost if you're starting outside planet this time so it's got a lot of information so i'll have the link to that i'm going to have a link to some lighting information there is a youtuber that i really like and my gardener michigan gardener i have some of his seeds and again if expense is an issue his seeds are the best price there's a small shipping fee but his seeds are very high quality at a great price um, I, there's going to be a lot of links. So if we didn't cover something here, you'll be able to get the information on it. Um, and what is the website that we can go to for the SEC? I'm going to give you the exact <clears throat> address because I forgot it last time. dbutah.wix.com. Wix site. The Wix site. dbutah.wix, W I X S I T E dot com slash forward slash p r e p prep <laughs> you can tell i'll call you <laughs> and the videos are posted there the um links will be posted there all of the old classes from last year are also mm -hmm. there so. and it's in the um blog section Yes. You have to look in the blog section. That's not necessarily intuitive, but that's where everything is. So. And I would like to see a class on gathering your seeds. Seed saving. Yeah. Because that, that can take a little bit of work, a little bit of management, because you want to make you sure there's no cross-pollination. Right, cross right. Open, open pollinated, and no, you don't want cross-pollination, so how do you prevent that? And then like tomatoes you have to ferment in order to get the seeds so there's there's some processes there you have to ferment them. Mm -hmm. yeah you have to let your plant yeah get to the whole point where the yeah so yeah kind of raw <laughs> that, that's a good description rotten <laughs> almost to that I point. Had come up by default <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's what it is because I didn't pick that. Yeah. Okay, so I am okay. giving away some Paul Robeson seeds. We, after, <laughs> when you stop the video, we will come up with a number um, and then whoever gets closest to that number can get the seeds. I also have here a Victoria rhubarb, if anybody would like it. I was rearranging things in my garden earlier. And is so, it a red, red? No, Victoria is green with some red. I've been trying to find a crimson here locally and not having great success. But Ladybug in Cedar City said that they are gonna get potted um, crimson rhubarb. They won't have bare root. And Ballard said they were getting some bare root, but then when I talked to them last, they said they could not get it. So it tastes the same. It's just not as pretty in a pod. Exactly. <laughs> so. okay. Wonderful. Well, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much.